there, there's probably one close by, and I um, invite you to turn with me to the book of Acts. Y'all, I'm so honored to be here today. I'm, I'm a little scared, but I'm so thrilled to be with you, and y'all look so great. We should take your picture. You know, when the scripture <clears throat> occurred, the church was in shambles. Everything that could happen bad in a church had happened. Every scary thing that could go on was occurring. The leader was gone. The, the number one guy had turned out to be a coward and quit. The guy who handled the money had sold him out. They wondered if they could trust anyone. Fifty days later, Pentecost, of course, coming from Pente, meaning 50. We read this scripture in the book of Acts, the second chapter. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together. Hallelujah. The word real, literally in the Greek means they were, it was unanimous. But they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. I normally leave when that happens. I don't know about you, but the violent wind comes and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appear among them and a tongue rested on each of them. And as, as all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living, living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered. People came to church that didn't plan on being there that day. And was bewildered because each one of them heard in their native language. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Sounds like they're Galileans, and yet, how is it that we hear each one of us in our own native language, Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs in our own language. That's a lot of different countries to cover. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? I'm going to move ahead in the scripture. G, uh, Peter quotes Joel. And he says, this is what's going on. In the last days it'll be, says God, that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Upon your sons and your daughters, they shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Upon my slaves, men and women, in those days, I'll pour out my spirit. And they'll prophesy. And I'll show portions in the heavens above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire, smoke and mist. And the sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. And then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you and be seated. That's a long scripture. I thank you for standing with me that long. Y'all, you'll be thrilled to know that I've lost my sermon up here and... Um, That'd be a fitting end to a good day, wouldn't it? Just, uh, y'all, what a blessing to be here. Do you feel like praying? If you don't, then, um, then may, we might have missed the purpose of the day. God brought us here that we might be open to him and his spirit. May we pray. Oh, precious and real God. Surprise our souls in worship. For that part of us that is broken and feels like it always will be. 
for that part of us that feels like joy has left us and will never return. For that part of us that sees death in this life more clearly than we see you and life itself, come and invade our hearts and our lives that we might discover you and follow you even to eternity. For we ask it in your name and for your sake. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah. Is this working now? Can I, may I move away? Is that all right? Yes. Yeah. Y'all, I am... Um, oh, hello. <laughs> I'm Steve Shugart. I've been a part of your church in many times, but more importantly, you've been a part of my life. Um, my sweet aunt, um, you ministered to her as she... Uh, left this world and went on to eternity. And my grandparents grew, uh, were lived on little Anafrel Street just back behind here. And on occasion, we would get to come to St. John's Rock Hill from Chester. And, um, and when I thought that God might be leading me into ministry, somewhere over there, I talked with an elder in the church and said, gosh, this, this could be what God is doing for me. So for all the places that you've ministered in my life. I'm so thankful. I'm also thankful to be here on Pentecost. Uh, aren't you? I never know quite what to do with Pentecost. Being a Methodist, I've been a Baptist for just a little bit, but I've been, mostly been a Methodist all my life. When I grew up in, in Chester, uh, we went to Little Bethel Chester downtown, and, um, and we were good, staunch Methodists. And one day I went to a Pentecostal service with one of my friends and my grandmother, Mama Bert. I, I told her later, I said, Mama Bert, I, I went to the Pentecostal church. And she said, well, don't tell anybody and it'll be all right. And I said, well, <laughs> praise God, you know. In those days, you wouldn't clap or do anything like that. And uh, we were scared to be friendly in some of those days. And, uh, but God is here with us today. And... Um, and I'm excited about what he is doing here and with you and me. And I'm wondering about the, the most exciting church service you've been to. I'm wondering when that was. You know, I, I, I go to church some now, uh, formal worship as a pastor, but mostly I'm, I'm in the pew. Uh, what I do today is I go to shootings for our state police. That's mostly what I do. And to find God's gift in the midst of all of that. And as I think about Pentecost and the, the exciting times in church, I remember one of my dear friends, Bob Robinson, who was a minister in the upstate up in Easley, South Carolina, and they were having revival at his little church, little mill church up there. And as they were having revival, um, the church sits on top of the fellowship hall. Do y'all remember when they used to have churches like that and they just built one structure and at the bottom place they'd have a fellowship hall and that's what they had there. They were up there singing and Bob said it was a hateful church. You know, people just didn't like each other and fussing about everything. And so they had this revival and people brought food in downstairs. And while they were up there singing and preaching on that first Sunday of revival, guess what happened? Some little boys from the town of Easley made their way. They heard all the commotion. They, they hadn't heard that much music in the church. And so as they made their way through, they opened up the doors, and lo and behold, there is a covered dish supper, fellowship lunch. I mean, and the boys did what? You know what they did. Yes. They went through and had brownies and fried chicken and ate like kings till one of the ushers, there you go. One of the ushers heard a little bit too much fun downstairs, went down, discovered them, and called the cops. Yes, thank you for that, ma'am. So they went, and uh, in those days, it's a little different than policing now. Took these, uh, took these guys down to the station just to scare them a little bit. And Bob, when the service was over and understood what was going on, somebody said, what are we going to do? And Bob Robinson said, I'm going to the jail. And he did. 
He got a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken. I don't even know if they have it in a bucket anymore. And went down there and fellowship with those boys. And today, at the Dream Center in Easley, which takes care of indigent people, there's a man who is much older now named Tommy who knows the Lord Jesus Christ and preaches in his church and was saved because Bob Robinson saw that there was something more going on than what was upstairs. Hallelujah. On the day of Pentecost, God came in and there was something more happening. They had just come for the celebration, but it was a scary time for them. The Jews had come from all over to Jerusalem. More were likely to come for the festival of Pentecost than any other time because it was a time that no one had to be a servant. All the servants were free on the day of Pentecost. So you didn't have to take care of your master. And so Jews from all over came to Jerusalem. And as they were in their worship, as they were doing all of this, something that had never happened before began to happen to these good people who were probably thrown. What is it that happened on the most exciting worship day in Scripture? So many great things happen. Uh, when I think about what it is, I don't know that we're able to replicate it. The big thing that happened was that God moved on his people. God moved in a way that they were really not expecting. You know, Jesus had, had died and, and been resurrected, but they weren't really sure what that meant. Peter, who had promised Jesus he would stay with him, Peter had thrown in the towel cursed like a sailor. Thomas, who was so strong, had doubted. Judas has left them, and they are in disarray. And I think about this world today and the places I go. It seems like we're in disarray sometimes, maybe in your life too. And you wonder where God is in the midst of this chaos and pain. They were together, first of all. Hallelujah. You know, one of the things I love about coming here, you know, when you invite a, another ministry and you always say, gosh, I don't know what kind of crowd we'll have on Sunday. I always think wherever two or three are really gathered in the name of Christ, they knew that power there at Pentecost. They had gathered because God had led them through such tough times that they knew that they had to rely on each other once and for all. There was nobody really else to talk to. And in the midst of their pain, they said, we're what we've got. You might be going through some of those times yourself right now. I know that a lot of us are. And we wonder who it is we can stand with. Deborah mentioned I was in Iraq for a while, and I was. I've been an army chaplain for a long time. And I loved being there, except being away from my family, because you're so close to each other. One of the, one of the times that I was there, one of my favorite stories is I was, uh, I was working as a chaplain, and we heard that a guy was going to take his life, a guy named Philip. And they called me, and they said, listen, we got to get up there. This soldier might take his life. And I said, okay. And y'all, I, I went off, and I, we go up to the RP-8, where Philip was stationed, and he was on a berm up here about uh, 20 feet high. And uh, we rolled in there, and I looked up in the sun, the bright Iraqi sun, and I, I said, is, is that Philip up there with his gun? And they said, oh, yes, sir, that, that's him. I, they said, we didn't want to upset him. We figured you'd take it from him. And I said, well, praise God, that's going to that's gonna be a sight to see. And they all came out to watch me take that weapon away. And... Um, and y'all, I climbed up there next to Philip. I said, Philip, what are we doing? He said, uh, sir, I got to get out of here. He said, uh, I got a plan. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot and go home. I said, well, partner, that's a bad plan. They're not going to let you go home. They're going to send you to Lonstuhl, Germany. And when you're through with that, uh, guess where they're going to send you? Where did they send you after that? Back to the war, right? And so I told that to Philip, and he looked at me, and he says, well, so if I shoot myself in the foot, I can't go home? I said, no. He said, well... 
what if I shoot you in the foot? I said, well, that's a bad idea. Let me hold your boot for you. Let's do something else. Philip calls me once a month now. We were all we had together. We were that so bound together in that zone, in that time, that we knew that we were what we had. The disciples had that. If you've been in a great church and a great worship service, you've been gathered with somebody that you can trust, somebody that you can share your soul with, somebody that you can, that you can come to the altar with. Somebody that you can be real enough to say, yes, Lord Jesus, I need you and this spirit to invade my life and take over in such a new way that I'm marked with red forever. That your cross is now a part of my life and people can see it in me and in us as we're together. They were together, powerfully together. They risked that and they also risked speaking up for God. The power of speaking for God today is able for us because they gave up the right to be God. Are you scared of watching TV? I am so frightened of it now. I barely can cut it on because I, I know that whatever side I'm not on is going to be on the television. I'm so frightened that the evil Democrats or evil Republicans or evil Tigers or evil game, it's just, it's, we're just so against each other, aren't we? I think part of it is because we've decided that we are the God person. We know best. We know what we should do. But when Peter stood up to speak, he knew that only God was the true God. He had tried it the other way. And so as he begins to preach out of Joel, it's confessional for Peter. Peter says, listen, I've been where you are, and I've been broken, and I've been lonely, and I've been following myself all these years, but on the most exciting worship day that ever happened that way, Peter said, God is with us. He came to deliver us, and this is the answer, Jesus the Christ, who can change us forever. And I don't know what your political party is. I don't know what team you pull for. I don't know what side of town you live on, but I do know this. The Spirit of the living God is speaking to us today, and it says that there must be somebody more wise, more powerful than you and me and just people in Washington. And that if we'll humble ourselves and give ourselves fully, he is faithful to redeem us fully as well. They risked taking the power to stand. Years ago, Sue and I started going and doing Salkahatchee ministry. I don't know if you do it here. I'm, I'm sure you do. You're such a great church. I was down in... Um, down in uh, Polly's Island, and I was under a house. We were trying to jack it up, and I was laying on my back. And I wasn't this big then, I was skinny, and I, so I got in there with a jack, and you've done it, maybe it's your house. And I'm jacking this house up literally behind me, and it fell. It comes down and stops, and I'm stuck. I can't move. And I'm reaching behind me in the dirt, and as I was doing it, I grabbed a snake. <laughs> now, I fought that thing for about five minutes, and I'm hollering, and I'm hollering so loudly because I'm scared of snakes. I'm terrified of snakes. <laughs> the two neighbors from either side of the house came. They hadn't spoken in years. And I'm hollering to the children, do you see it? Do you see it? And the, they're all gathered around and people are coming around. And, and one little girl said, just let it go. And I didn't even know how I could do that because I was so busy trying to keep it from biting me. <laughs> You're right. When we got out, what was it? It was a hose pipe. That's right. <laughs> I'd been fighting that thing tooth and nail for about 10 minutes. I was exhausted. It's like the one in your backyard right now. It's old and green and just had enough movement in it that um, 
when we got out and I still had it in my hand. And as I looked up there were those two neighbors laughing at me, <laughs> having a big time. And they were Hispanic people. I wasn't sure what they were saying, but I'm sure stupid was one of the words that they were using. And I noticed them standing together. We fixed that house up that day. They, I don't know what the fight was about. I still don't know. But I do know that on the shed that separated those properties, one of the women had taken that old piece of pipe that had torn, that I had had as a snake, and she had nailed it on the side of that shed. Somewhere in all of this divisiveness, they were able to remember that they were people and just people. And that there was something greater going on. And they watched the ministry of God take place. And when I left on that last day at Salkahatchee, there was that piece of pipe and there they were talking. The day of Pentecost is about a day of yielding to God to his amazing power that helps us to speak and move in such a way that God could capture us and that all could see it. It is, might be about a day of judgment, but it's not your judgment or mine about God. But mostly it is the effectual promise that he comes to deliver you and me. And the red that you wear is symbolic of so many things, but certainly of the blood of Jesus the Christ, who came to set us free and give us a party and let us go to the jail where children can be redeemed and eat full, have full bellies and have full lives and come back to serve him. And maybe you'd forgotten that, or maybe I had this morning. But it is to that life and to that blessing that we're invited this morning. Pentecost. Is God reaching out to you and saying it's full and it's real, it's joyful? That you can speak and know and move with me and be my servant and be marked with me with this red forever? Let us pray. Mighty God, some of us have forgotten your power this morning. Have forgotten that you're real and able to create and redeem. And so on this day, Lord, we ask that your spirit move. Not just with this church, but with my very soul that you'd so color me now and forgive me now and bless me now that I could know joy where there was sorrow and I could know your power where there is such weakness that I could find a savior for eternity. Come in today, come in to stay. Come into our hearts, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is hymn number 560. We invite you to stand as you sing.